Good afternoon and welcome to this training on journal article writing that is jointly organized by the Nigerian Association of Agricultural Economists and the Feed the Future Nigeria Agricultural Policy Project. The Feed the Future Nigeria Agricultural Policy Project is a USAID funded project to support the Nigerian agricultural policy process with improved dialogue and policy recommendations that are based on credible evidence backed by scientific research. This training is one among several activities that the project organizes with our partners to strengthen capacity of young Nigerian scholars. This particular training on how to write journal articles is structured around a key lecture that will be delivered by Professor Thomas Reardon. He's a Michigan State University Distinguished Professor of Agricultural Economics. And this lecture will then be followed by a series of group discussions and feedback via short videos that we have put together. We hope that you will find all this material very useful as you continue to build your research portfolio. Thank you very much. I will focus my talk on the art of research discovery and writing articles. And <clears throat> I was thinking about my path in life learning how to write articles. <clears throat> and I think it started back at the time that I found it so frightening to even think about that when I was at Berkeley doing my PhD back uh, 35 years ago, 30 years ago. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little strange today. And um, I would look up to my professors, uh, Alain de Javry, David Zilberman, other major figures that had been leading lights in, and are leading lights in the profession of agriculture economics. And uh, I just thought that their writing articles was something magic, uh, that it was, they were geniuses and just created articles, and that there's no method to write articles. And uh, I never even asked them, is there a method to write articles? Do you have any structure to the way you think and approach these things? I just assumed that when and if it ever came time that I wrote articles, it would come like a thunderbolt from heaven and then I would be able to do it or not. Okay, kind of inspiration. And I realized that today, uh, 30, 35 years later, I am, um, uh, my, I've written 150 articles, published them. I <clears throat> am maybe number two or number three in global citations of Google Scholar. And so I, I learned how to do it. And what I found is that no students or colleagues ever came to me and asked me, how do I do it? Is there a method? I think they must also assume that it's just something one learns how to do, but there are no courses that teach this. And so often people try and try and don't get published. But we all want to publish because nowadays that's the path um, to promotion, to getting a job, et cetera. And that's for articles. But I always also think that even the conception of a proposal for a dissertation, which in the US is usually three or four articles, journal articles put together, not a long, not one of these old style things that was a long book style thing, but now it's three or four articles put together. To even conceive of the chapters uh, as articles, which the committee always wants them to be, I think of a proposal as an article without findings. So it has all the steps we're going to talk about today to think about what you're going to do, but then you need to do it and sell it, okay? And so today I'll talk about what I've discovered in terms of how to write articles. And I'll, <coughs> this phrase I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in a second, but the idea that uh, really the, the two ideas that fought in my mind uh, for writing an article were, uh, is it just creative magic or is there some mechanical form or structure to doing articles? And that, question was answered for me just before I came to Michigan State University <clears throat> at the end of the 1980s, and I was coming in 1992. And basically, uh, I was at a friend's house, you know, at a, at, a, uh, at a dinner, and I was looking at their bookshelf, and I saw a book that was called uh, Philosophy of the Samurai, okay, those, the 
Japanese warriors. And I opened it up and was leafing through it, and I found a, a phrase there, which is enter into form in order to exit from form. And I remember I sat there for maybe 60 seconds or a minute or two minutes looking and staring at that and absorbing what does it mean. And I realized suddenly that this phrase would change my whole life. Because what I'd realized is that when I went to write an article uh, in my early career, I would just try to imagine what form should the, art, should the article take? What structure should it have? How should I start? Where should I start? Where should I end? What am I doing? Um, and then I realized that this, if you look at this, it's from martial arts, right? Samurai. Enter into form. So in martial arts, you know, you practice a thousand times, you know, blocking upward and blocking downward and, you know, punches and kicks. And you do it over and over and over again uh, in, in kind of prescribed forms. And you learn the form, you internalize the form so that uh, when then you get to combat where you have to use a form, instead of having no form to draw on, no structure, no idea, no logic to follow, in a sense you begin fighting but with the form that is in already internalized in you from uh, uh, looking at the structure of the form. Right. So basically, you know, the, the, the motions that you make uh, in a fight are seem to be random, but, but you're creating depending on the circumstance, but you're using already formulas and structures and ideas that you've absorbed and absorbed. And so what I did is um, I then went in my early career here at MSU and I took many articles of gurus, you know, of top Oga. You know, I looked at them, uh, really people that had published well, like a Zilberman and et cetera. And I studied their articles and I drew on the board, I did a flow chart of how they did the articles. What did they do first? What did they do second? How did they structure? And what I found after many articles studying them, yeah, which I highly recommend doing, not studying so much the little ideas, the specifics, but what did they do in the article? How did they win? What was the new thing? How did they structure it? And I found that everyone did the same thing. That's what really struck me. It was over and over again the same structure uh, and the same approach with small variations in it. Uh, and I'll talk about that structure today. And I'll also talk about what I think is even harder or, 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 or better not harder because it's easy to understand the structure, but to create research, to think about what is the research question that you want to ask. How do you do that? For me, uh, I, I was appalled by that because I just thought one just sits there and reads and reads and reads and then suddenly it's like an apple hitting you on the head and you think I have a research question. But I think there are even mechanical ways to do this. Uh, to combine form and structure with creativity. And all the time, when you write an article, you have to keep in mind two things, okay? That it's actually two steps. The first thing is you have to convince two or three international reviewers first, okay? It doesn't matter if your committee likes it, your professor likes it, you know, anybody likes it. You have to say, I have to convince two or three people that are chosen, usually the way that they're chosen is there's somebody that, let's say if you're writing on Nigeria, there's somebody that is an expert in Nigeria, one of the top agricultural economists like Akin Adeshina or somebody like that is the reviewer. So that when you write, you don't say Nigeria is a country in Africa, that you know, you don't say these kind of general things to the person. You're defending your life in the, in the sense of trying to convince that person that you're saying something that is a new step in understanding Nigeria. But then there's two other reviewers, or one. One is a subject matter specialist that doesn't care about Nigeria at all. It doesn't matter that you say this is a new finding for Nigeria. It's just they want to say at an international level, did you say something that moved this debate forward? Okay. And then, you know, there might be, um, you know, a third person. So those people are judging you. They're the person you should have in your mind at all times. Nobody else. Okay. And if your committee, your doctoral dissertation committee, or your graduate committee, or your mentorship committee, if your professor is not taking on 
the mentality of those reviewers, then they're doing you a disservice. Okay, if they say this is good or this is really nice or interesting or this is the way we do it here, and they're not thinking about what the reviewer is going to say, then they're hurting you. Okay, then the second step is you're going to excite the world and affect it and get citations. Okay, so it's a two-step process, keeping the reviewer in mind. So what I'll do in the second section is think about this general structure that I've observed from reading and reading many articles and mapping them and thinking about them. Um, and I'll say some things that you should not do, okay, as I go along, very important. Um, but the introduction is absolutely central. It's maybe 80% of the importance of an article because if you don't hit a home run on the article introduction, you'll lose the reviewer. The reviewer has one hour to look at the paper in their busy schedule. And they don't like you, Nis. They don't know you. Your name is not on it. You're not uh, basically, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily care about the topic. What they want to be done is sold on it as a contribution to the literature. And um, so within this introduction, uh, you know, I've also put page numbers here because the, the paper is going to be something like 20 pages uh, altogether, double space, bef besides the references and the tables, and in that space, um, you know, you, you, it's approximately a tenth, ten percent of the paper that's going to be the introduction. Uh, and I've also noted some things in green, for example, I have green for literature, green for literature, and you'll see it in every section because I am going to recommend that you not have a literature review section, but rather literature is brought to bear in every single one of the sections. So in the first, in the introduction, you have uh, the literature stated as a series of like stepping stones or dominoes, bing, 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 bing. And the bing is the gap that you're going to address. And so you feel, you make the, the reviewer feel like he's falling down steps, bing, 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 bing. There's the gap. And he went through the steps of the literature and he can't escape from how interesting it is that there's something like that left. Then the research questions are completely meshed with and mirror the gap, okay? They are more broad than it, and I'll talk about what are research questions later. And then the hypotheses, the key hypotheses are stated, and they should be interesting, and I'll explain how uh, that mirror only the research questions. They don't go, you know, broader than that. And then uh, after that, uh, you want to be able to state the specific con contribution. And the contribution will be. Uh, what is the contribution of filling that gap for the international literature? So it's you know, saying this is a big contribution to help policymakers in Nigeria. Don't say that, okay? Just, you have to, the reviewer doesn't care about that. They want to know what, how does this affect the international literature? <clears throat> so this is huge importance to sell the article. I'll come back to it. The second session section then sets out uh, the general theory or model that you're going to use, not the specific econometric or empirical model, to test the hypotheses uh, that you stated in the first part. And this can be one to three pages. The length will depend on the contribution type. If it's a more theoretical paper that means to make some methodological or especially theoretical contribution, it might be long, longer. Uh, but most of the time it'll be from a couple pages and we'll Link in, for example, if it's a paper on, um, I'll use this example many times, rural non-farm employment, okay, as a labor supply um, <clears throat> article, then you might have the labor supply function here, you know, and explain this is the way in the literature um, labor supply of a farm household has been modeled to the various sectors, to the farm sector, to off-farm sector, etc. You lay out that model as the appropriate theoretical base of what you're going to be talking about. Then the third part of the article, which you notice is only three or four pages, okay, and then many times, you know, I, I've seen this especially with students, but also with many articles I've reviewed, is that they make a gigantic section out of context, partly because they overshoot. They give too much information and it's too general. They're talking about uh, the history of this area or the the crops, the general crops, many things that are not specific to their research questions or their hypotheses. But this gives the context, it explains, for example, the Nigerian context, and three or four key points to justify the specific approach and questions and hypotheses and specification of the model that you're going to use. So, for example, uh, you know, if you're talking about um, 
aquaculture and can be state, as we're just thinking about recently, uh, then you might have something not on the general cropping pattern of Kebbi State or its general geography. You want to be able to bring in something that explains what are the zones of Kebbi State that are relevant to thinking about fishing and aquaculture. And then, and then second, the, the, the reviewer is thinking Kebbi State is a semi-arid tropics place. It's not a wet place near the coast. How can we be talking about fish or aquaculture? And there you would say it's crossed by the Niger River, one of the main rivers in the world, and you know has a web of small tributaries that create wetlands everywhere, so there's plenty of water for both fishing and for aquaculture. Then that's the second point. Then you have maybe one or two other points because you're justifying your model and your general thing. You're not talking about the history in general. And then you also bring in descriptive statistics from your data uh, that you know describe the sample, etc., to be able to give a feeling uh, for the patterns in the data to the reviewer, okay? I said to the reviewer. The reader, if you get past the reviewer, the, re the re reader will like your paper. But if you don't get past the reviewer, then you don't have a paper at all, okay? So you're trying to convince them three, four points. And I want to make a point about how to write. I find that while many people are told to not use first, second, third in their writing, uh, that's, I think, a wrong idea for writing technical articles, <clears throat> especially if you're relatively new at writing articles because people tend to write in such a way that has a lot of repetitions, a lot of disorder, a lot of blah blah blah, and, and then you find that they'll say, first, uh, the sky is blue and the clouds are white and the trees are you know brown and green, and second, the earth is brown, but also the trees are uh, brown and green. And then third, the sky is uh, blue, but also the ground is brown. You know, and so they'll mix, they'll say the same thing over and over in three different pa patterns, but they'll bring in a new point later on. And that's an extremely common error in writing. So to get around that, I always go first. And I'll show you, I always write with a dense outline first so that it's clear to me exactly what I'm saying. And then I fill in a little bit. I don't just start writing, you know, and then it's a mess. So uh, that's a way to keep yourself clear by saying first, second, third in the way that you're writing. The fourth section then comes back in with this con context, um, but with the general model, and then I'm using econometrics, although you might be writing another kind of article. It's easier for me to spe specify one kind of article here uh, for, for the discussion, but you would then lay out the econometric specification. So, you know, if you had a consumption function, a consumption function is a function of prices, of income, of preferences. It's a general function. But if you were doing a specific paper on, uh, let's say, rice consumption in Nigeria, uh, then you would have to say, what are the variables within the preference vector that reflect uh, possible preferences, like demography, demography, north of south of Nigeria, ethnic group, distance from the city, and you would put in other things that would be specificities related to preferences. And, they, and usually the way that you define those specificities would be a function of the context that you discuss, discuss. So in the context, if you're putting North and South Nigeria as a different preference proxies in a consumption function, uh, you will have justified the fact that North and South uh, Nigeria have different characteristics that might affect the consumption of rice, okay? And so that would come in and th then you would have already set that up there. And then when you give the specific variables, you would also be stating specific hypotheses there. You already gave general hypotheses at the beginning in the introduction to draw in the audience, but here you're giving some specific hypotheses to the key. Uh, and then data and sampling method you lay out here, and the key thing in the data and sampling method is to convince the reviewer that you have the right kind of sample for what you're testing. What do you think is the main characteristic of the sample that would be necessary, that the reviewer would be looking for? Okay, well it might not have to be random if you, ha if you have a priori information on the weights. Uh, so it could be stratified random, you know, uh, but they'll look for that to see whether, to what degree, it's defensible in terms of randomness and stratification. What else is the key characteristic 
in terms of the, the, the nature of the sample and what kind of observations one would expect in the sample that the reviewer would be looking for. Always think this way. You first think, what is the reviewer looking for? And then you write the point. Any answers? Basically, it's variation. So if I say I'm going to study, uh, let's say, the price behavior of the manure market, or, or let's say not the manure market, but let's say the fertilizer market in Nigeria, and if the price is set, and I'm looking across households, I'm not going to see the price varying over households because it's set administratively. So immediately the reviewer would say, how could you study the price behavior of fertilizer when you don't see variation? Or if you say, I'm going to study in the, um, let's say, in the migration, uh, I'm going to study migration, I'm going to look at gender differences in migration internationally from Nigeria. But if you, if, if you don't have any way, you know, if there's an a priori understanding that maybe there would be very few women in the international migration cohort, and you don't have a sample that makes sure to have women selected so that you show that you'll have enough variation, but it's going to be random, but there's some a priori belief that they might have too few women within such an, a random sample, the reviewer would say, how would you have sufficient variation in the data to be able to assure uh, that you can show the determinants of women migrating versus not migrating? Or they might look at it and say, uh, you're testing for difference in rainfall, uh, you know, on, on the crop production, but you only have one zone. You've hunkered down into one particular area, and over the villages one would expect little difference in rainfall, some, but little. So there won't be sufficient variation for this. So essentially what you're doing is selling your data set as being adequate, either with sufficient randomness, or with sufficient, and or with sufficient, or always and, with sufficient variation to be able to test your hypotheses. And then of course you're laying out the estimation method that's, that could actually be quite a central part of the paper, um, but the estimation method that you'll use for this. Do you need to control uh, for some factors, for example, heterogeneity or heteroscedasticity, or other things that, um, or truncated distributions of the variable, and therefore you're saying, well, I'm using a truncated distribution um, regression for this. Okay, so this is an important section. Uh, then you have your results of your regressions or your experiment. And this is very important because often what people do is they say, okay, I have five tables. You should have five tables maximum. Five tables and figures maximum. The all tables and figures, not more. Maybe six. Okay, and when you look at that, Typically, what somebody that's not experienced with this does, it says, okay, let's look at row one. Here's what I found. Row two, what I found. Row three, what I found. And basically, um, in this case, you know, you, uh, you're going to lose the, the reviewer. What you want to do is, when you go to your tables and your findings, you go back to what your research questions are. And then you say, okay, my first research question was this. How did I, what did I find? Okay, and, and number two and number three and number four. So usually I say first, second, third, fourth, and I pick the four main findings, okay? Or if there's several determinants that are important, I pick three, four key determinants of the behavior uh, that are explained and found, and then I signal them and number them, and then I also explain them and compare them again with the literature say this is a finding that's similar to what was found in China but never in Africa. I expected it in China but didn't expect it here. And then you might also do some robustness things. Okay, you know, for example, you found the herder pastoral uh, you know, farmer interaction gave rise to such and such a result that seemed to vary inversely or let's say it varied in some kind of a U-curve with a distance to, um, you know, distance to the road. And you say, why is that? That's a very interesting. I have some, you know, some variation here. Could you just pop the window open a little bit for some air? Um, and, uh, you know, I found some difference of that. And then you might do an additional statistical test to, to, to try to explain. And so, basically, um, you know, here you're, you might do some additional robustness tests and explorations in, uh, you know, in the data to be able to 
dig deeper and deeper into some specific thing. That's extremely useful, or do some scatter plots or whatever if you come upon something that's really interesting, but that might have some complication or paradox that needs to be explained. And then finally, this is really important because very often, and I've seen this over and over again, uh, especially younger uh, writers, you know, think that um, now is the time in the conclusion to say all I want to say in life. You know, I have some policy thoughts, I have some political thoughts, I have some philosophical thoughts, I have, I wanted to say something about general problems in Nigeria or the world or whatever. In fact, don't say any of it, okay? You say, what did I find? I specifically found three things. What did those three things change in the debate that isn't already known? that I can suggest are important and have some implication. But nothing beyond that, Not, no call for a better governance of you know, my district or more infrastructure unless you found a result about infrastructure. This is a short section, okay, don't over promise and don't over blow. So this is, this is the general lay of the land. Is there any question up to this point? Okay, now you have more oxygen in the air so that you'll be able to be alive, right? Okay, usually when I'm in Nigeria, I see Ibadan and I gave a talk, everybody starts shouting at me and uh, attacking me and asking hard questions. So maybe, maybe you needed more oxygen or maybe it's so cold today that your brains are not working. Now, I want to tell you what to avoid because, you know, these are things that I've seen a million times and I really feel strongly about. First of all, don't talk down to the reviewer. You know, don't say... When you write a paper on Nigeria, assume you're writing to a person that knows much more about Nigeria than you do, okay? The most famous agriculture economist of Nigeria or something like that, when you write, don't say Nigeria has a problems and, you know, general things or it's, this is its geography and this is its history. Assume the person knows everything, okay? First, that reduces the vagueness and ambiguity of what you're writing. Second, it doesn't anger the reviewer who knows about it and feels that they're being condescended to. Also, everybody knows about Africa and Asia now. If you wrote a paper about Nigeria 20 years ago in the international audience, people would say, wow, this is all new to me, interesting. Now everybody knows. Everybody knows. And, uh, and then second, often you're told to do this in your courses, don't do it. Okay, don't have a section on objectives. And I'll, I'll give you more of a reason why. But one of the main reasons for that is that the, your objective is simply one thing, to answer the research questions. And often what happens in the objectives part, is people say, I hope to help the policymakers of Nigeria to have a, a better understanding of this, or I, help to I hope to explain how many women are migrating, or whatever you're explaining, that's a factual question, or your dream, or something about your policy, I hope to answer a policy question. No, your specific Objective is always just one thing to answer your research question. And it often, uh, when people put objectives, it becomes vague and confusing as to what exactly the article does. Third, very important, is don't deviate from the tight focus of the research questions in all the rest of the paper. Often people will say, here's my research question. What is the relationship between um, you know, the uh, herders and the farmers in such and such an area? Does one, you know, create insecurity for the other. If that's your question, then don't talk more generally about land patterns and land markets and whatever, unless it's exactly related to your specific research question. So you keep the tight focus. And, like, uh, and then, as I mentioned already, don't ever have a review of the literature as a, sec as a separate section. Every section has to have literature in it. And also, don't start with a problem statement. This is all contradictory, I'm sure, to what you're told. Forget what you were told. Okay, uh, the key thing is that the introduction just has a lead up to the gaps. That's your, your problem statement. Not, we have a lot of problems in this country, da, 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 all this stuff, you just erase it, okay? And then you say, you're not talking about general problems, you're coming right down to the gap in the literature that you're looking at, I'll come to that. And finally, this is uh, why I'm gonna use this as a segue to the talking about introduction. Don't assume that because your issue is important in your state or your country, or it's the first time that it was looked at there, or it has some policy relevance, that the reviewer, the reviewer is international, the reviewer doesn't care, the reviewer is looking at 200 countries, it doesn't matter. And so they want to know, is that something that's contributing to the international literature? So the strong introduction is absolutely crucial. 
So let's focus in on the introduction and think about it. Um, the, uh, the first part of the introduction, as I said earlier, focuses in on the gap. And again, you know, I know this sounds weird to you, but I actually have this sound in my mind, bing, bang, bong, bong, bong. You know, and I even repeat that when I write an introduction because I feel like the, the way I want to show the literature went like a step, step, step. Here's a step with a gap. Then the next step filled that gap but left a gap. Then the next step filled that gap but left a gap. And then it comes to our gap, okay? And, and I'll give you an example from my own work. You know, this is something that I did a lot in the 1990s, was on rural non-farm employment, okay, in Burkina Faso, for, to be specific. Um, and so when I started the article, I thought, let's look back a couple decades and think about um, how did the labor market literature analyze rural areas in Africa or other places. And back in 1969, Heimer and Resnick wrote a paper that, folk that said it isn't just farm you know, work that rural people are doing, they're also doing z-good production. Z-good production is, are things like cooking and cleaning and watching children, etc. So they were showing that there was a diversification of labor use uh, beyond the farm. Then there was another wave approximately in the 1980s in the overall world literature on uh, labor markets in rural areas uh, that focused first on plantation labor, but then with the green revolution and you know some of the, the the changes in technology, there was a lot of use of labor and a lot of hiring of labor. So the uh, literature focused on the agricultural la labor market, the wage labor market. You working on another farm, okay? And that was interesting because the earlier literature had been anthropological, saying people just do group. You know, I work for you one day and next week you come and work for me for free. It's, you know, that's the traditional way around the world before farm labor, labor wage work was done. So, you know, the excitement in this literature in the 1980s was to say, look, at there's a farm wage labor market that's, that's forming. But people didn't focus on non-farm activity because at that time there was a feeling that this is farm areas farm. There's nothing else there besides farming. You know, maybe a little bit of Z good where they might uh, gather something, you know, do something uh, beside farming, uh, but just small things that they make in their own home. You know, they make their own furniture, they do this and that. It's not rural non-farm employment in manufacturers or services. And so that was missing from the ag. Now in the early, uh, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s in the world, uh, especially in Latin America and Asia, now there suddenly was an introduction of the idea of non-farm, but migration. People leaving the rural area to go work, not work in the rural area. Why was that? Why did that occur? You can even understand and explain you know, to, um, you know, to the reviewer why that stage in the literature occurred. Why do you think that that happened? Usually the literature follows real world events. There was structural transformation. What, what kind of structural transformation was occurring at this time? 1990s, early 1990s, in many developing countries. Urbanization? I'm sorry? Urbanization? Yes, yes, urbanization, exactly. So urbanization was occurring very quickly. Nigeria, you know, let's say in 1970s, 1980s, was maybe 15, 20% of the country was urban. Now it's 50, 50%, right? So it's become, and soon it'll be more than that. And so the migration from rural to urban areas became all the rage, to all the interest to, to focus on, and the, the, the literature only focused on that. Why did it only focus on that in the area of non-farm? Why, why did it not focus on local rural non-farm? Any ideas? Basically, there was still this held over idea that the rural areas were only farming, and they, they produced by their own labor, z-good production, uh, anything that else that they needed, and that there wasn't any kind of multipliers or linkages away from agriculture. So that um, what we then found, and this is one of the ways you find the link, is in our survey we found that 
uh, the rural non-farm employment was about 50% of rural household income in uh, Burkina Faso in 1992 in our survey. So we were saying, wow, 50% is like 50% more than the literature thought. They didn't even know this giant thing was there. By the way, what's the share of rural non-farm employment in income in rural Nigeria? Do you know? It's about 60 or 70 percent. It's more than this. Okay, farming is only about 30 percent of income. Okay, so so the surprise there is the liter the literature didn't have very much at that early time on rural non-farm employment, and so I said, look at you know before it was this, then it was this, then it was this, but it left the literature hasn't been focusing on this, and my article will focus on that. Okay, and uh, you know or you could say. The, maybe the literature had focused on the rural non-farm employment on income, but not its effect on technology or whatever other gap. So you're leading them up to the water and then you get them to drink. Now the second thing after you've identified the gap is to state two, one or two or three research questions that directly flow from that gap, not general. And very important is that these research questions are not factual questions. So you don't say, for example, how much rural non-farm employment is there in Nigeria or in Burkina Faso? Uh, that's a factual question. That, that flows from the research question, okay? Nor is it a policy question. You don't ask, the article is not to answer policy questions. Policy questions are there and the answers to research questions can inform policy questions. So if you say, my, my question is, what should the government of Nigeria do to help women enter rural non-farm employment? That, that's a consequence or an implication. It's not the research question. The research question is, what determines whether women enter non-farm employment? Okay. So, that, uh, so uh, in this case, for example, the, usually the, the research questions are causal. Okay. For example, what are the determinants of the supply of labor to rural non-farm employment? Okay, uh, so it's determinants of, or what are the effects of rural non-farm employment on something else like agricultural technology adoption or processed food consumption? I'm working on that with Soweda. Okay, so it's usually the determinants or effects that are research questions. And then you can justify the importance of those questions in terms of policy questions, research debates, etc. cetera, uh, but it's not the same as the, the research question is a research question. And then third, this is, I think, a fascinating uh, discovery that I was led to back in the early 90s, is you have hypotheses that relate to, um, let's say, the testing of the, you know, the exploration of the research question. So let's say, let's imagine this, if you have the supply, can you see that? If you have the supply of labor you know, to uh, you know, non-farm sector, uh, by a farm household and you know it's usually a function of uh, let's say the wage of agriculture the wage of non-agriculture the price of agriculture the price of non-agricultural products um, and then some kind of capital vector and maybe some kind of risk vector in the capital vector you uh, you often have the farmland the farm size okay now when I uh, I remember my friend Ed Taylor helped me with this because I was doing this paper for the job market, for this job market, for MSU. And, um, and I said, the amount of farmland that you have will affect whether you do rural non-farm employment. What was my hypothesis? What sign did I put on that? Would, if you have more farmland, will you do less rural non-farm employment or more? Any guesses? I'm sorry? You do more. More land, more rural non-farm employment. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Why is that? If um, the amount of land that you have will kind of affect the number of people that are putting in there to do the work, the labor but, bringing in. But is that negative? Is it substitution? Are you saying if you have more land, you have to use more people on the land and therefore you don't have them to work off farm? Or are you saying, what are you saying? I'm saying if you have more land, 
that if your land is large, you have more people working in there. You have to bring in more people to work that land to get out what you want to get out. Yeah, but this is rural non-farm employment. So what I'm saying is you, let's say you're the farm owner, and I'm asking, if you have a bigger and bigger farm, will that mean that you'll do more farm work, more non-farm work, work off your farm? No. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Okay, okay so it's, it's negative. So more farm work, uh, you would say negative, right? Yeah. So that's what I said too. And so my friend, Ed Taylor, said, uh, this is not going to sell. I said, what do you mean it won't sell? He said, what sells is if there's an ambiguous hypothesis. Because if it's so obvious, then the person said, this is a boring article. It's not worth testing. What's the empirical you know, interest here? Instead, you say, he said always, and then uh, that's where I got my own thought of this toggle switch, I, you know, a switch, where I said, okay, this is what I thought, negative, what you said. Now, attack her point. Give me a positive uh, impact. Go ahead. Oh, you can, please. Okay, who else? <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, you, you could uh, include uh, maybe technology, and that will have uh, you spend more, less time in the, on the farm and more time outside of the farm. Okay, that's good. So if you had some other complementary capital like a tractor here, mm -hmm. then that might neutralize the, the land effect. That's a good point. Okay, so you could add another variable here. Excellent. Okay. I didn't do that because in Burkina they didn't have any equipment of any kind then, but you could say in, in the Nigeria case. What else, if you didn't have any equipment, would you imagine is a positive effect that land might have on working off the farm? You have more land, you work more off the farm. Yes, sir? To have funds to pay the workers on your farm. Absolutely. So, uh, if, if let's say that and now, what that, and then he asked me, because I said that, I answered it like that, and then he said, yes, it could be there's a liquidity constraint, a cash constraint, uh, you know, uh, that you might have to even work off farm. Because if you want to start a tailor shop or a commerce business, you need money. And you say, well, I have money because I have a good farm. So it could be that, or you could use the money from the farm to pay somebody to work on it for you, and you go do your tailor business. What about the factor markets? What about the credit market with that? Then you have to explain to the reviewer, what about the credit market would, um, would be necessary? What condition of the credit market would be necessary for that effect to be true? Get ready, get set, go. If there's a credit market, then there wouldn't be that effect. Mm -hmm. If everybody can go get a loan from the bank, then it doesn't matter if you have a farm. It, you need to have something like a credit market constraint so here you have, you know, missing credit market, you can't go to the bank. So if you have your own source of cash, which is from your farm, then that can help you start the non-farm business. So you have to explain why you're selecting those, you know, those hypotheses. And then by having two different hypotheses, then the reviewer is very interested. They say, what do you think you're going to find? That's interesting. There's two possibilities. It's not obvious. You know, that's how you draw the reviewer in. Okay. Now, uh, you know, so this is very important. And then, of course, in the introduction, you're going to state your key methods used in your data, as I already mentioned, briefly, uh, just to show that you're going to have a great method to do this and that you can do it. And then finally, very important, in the introduction, lead the reviewer by the hand and tell the person what is the contribution that you're making, okay? Because there's different kinds of contributions. For example, you know, you can have... Um, you know, a new method, a, a new theory. I've never met anybody that's written an article that's written a new theory. It's very uncommon. Okay. You could write an article and you could say, my contribution is a new theory. That's improbable. Okay. But let's say, if you say, I'm going to use a regular theory that's available, but I'm going to have a new model, you know, to, um, you know, to test and explain it, then that's more common. For example, the theory is uh, there, but I'm going to add uh, some kind of interesting uh, risk term or something like that. Or I'm going to use an old model, you know, but let's say a new method of estimating the model, okay? Obviously, that's what Tobin did with his Tobit, where he says, well, I'm going to do a truncated distribution and estimated it with his Tobit model.
Or you're going to say, I'm going to use an old method, but a new application. Okay, and here is where, you know, probably most of us are in agriculture economics because we have a new data set, a new country, a new issue that maybe deals with already methods that are known. And we say, I'm going to test this in Nigeria. Then that's where you have to prove to the reviewer that doing a new application, and I'll give some examples in a moment, will be a wow factor for the literature that it'll make. It's not just one more application. Like, you know, this fish consumption demand function was run in Tanzania. Now we're going to run it in Nigeria. Yeah, so, you know, the reviewers say, so what? It's very important that Nigerians know about this. Fine, do it as a report, not as an article. If you do it as an article, tell me why is that application different? Tanzania is different from Nigeria, but how? Why is that interesting then for the world literature? That even if it were called country X and Y, it would be interesting, right? Um, so now we have to think about how the research question is posed to think about how a new application would be interesting. Um, and also, you know, of course, when you pick your journal, sometimes just description is enough if the topic is very new. When I wrote about supermarkets, uh, it was pretty new in the literature and uh, to write about it in developing countries. So I easily published many articles uh, before then I moved into the phase of the competition where I needed a big uh, data sets and econometrics, etc., or a theory uh, to differentiate the product. <clears throat> so let's then think about, uh, in this context, how we create a, a research question. And I think that this is, again, one of the absolutely key things to, uh, that I, I learned by trial and error, is that there's a mechanical way of thinking up research questions. Okay, and um, think of it um, as shock behavior outcome, okay? And think of shock not as like a, you know, I got, I found out I have cancer or something like that. It's more like a shock is a variation in the right hand side variable affecting behavior. So if we go to the consumption function, we could, or, or even to, let's say, if we look at the supply of labor function that we already talked about, let's say there's climate change and it increases the risk in agriculture, the shock would be, here's a right hand side variable, an increase in the risk in agriculture, how would that affect my supply of labor, and then I would have a hypothesis about that. If it's to manage risk off farm, on farm, I might do more supply of labor off farm to compensate the risk in agriculture. So the shock is something that changes, and then you look at behavior and outcome. Now, my method to use with this, I call the toggle switch method. Okay, so the toggle switch. Can, I don't know if you if you go here, over here to the light. Okay, so if you say, uh, let's say, the literature has focused so long on demand, 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 what would the toggle switch be? Supply. supply. Yeah. The literature is focused so much on an aggregate supply function, what would the toggle switch be? Disaggregate. The literature has been absolutely myopic, focusing always on the short term. What about the long term. Okay, so what I did is when I then mapped the literature and thought about my research questions, I said, what is the literature done? And then I did the toggle switch. Okay, I just flipped it and then said, what, what would be the situation? Just like we did with our discussion of what affects rural non-farm employment, I said, everybody thinks that more farmland would mean less rural non-farm employment. Let's flip it. If you flip it, you say it means more. And then, once you flip it automatically, then force yourself to think why. And then, you have an article moving, okay? Because then, and so, um, uh, this is really good also for mapping the literature. Because what I do, for example, is I would go through uh, the literature, and I would say, uh, as I'll, I'll, I'll mention it in a minute, I would say, uh, let's say most, in fact, I just showed you, I would say the literature has been work focusing on farm sector, farm sector, farm sector, farm sector, farm sector, toggle switch, non-farm sector. Easy. And then I just say, has the literature looked at non-farm sector? It turns out it's, it, it's descriptive, 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 explanatory? No. You know, so I just do my, I just see how has the, the literature itself toggled over shocks, 
over behavior and over outcomes, and then I, I do flow charts and I see where the flips have been, and then I see where the openings are or where my interest fits into it. Okay, and so uh, an example of that, if you look at shock behavior outcome, let's look at you know variations on shock. Okay, these are like doing different kinds of shock. Um, so, for example, if you uh, if you look at the nature of the shock uh, in the literature on rural non-farm employment, I'm using this a lot. Um, you know, you might have just looked at things like prices in or in normal, you know, let's say normal years, okay, normal rainfall years, and then I discovered that the literature had not looked at abnormal rainfall years, drought. I said, that's amazing. How could it not have done that? But it turned out that none of the literature had looked at before and after drought and seen how behavior and determinants of rural non-farm employment differed. And I had that data so I could look at before and after so I could change from the, reg the literature which didn't look at the drought as a shock, I could add it. Okay, let's look at another um, <clears throat> way of looking. So that's shock behavior outcome. So I gave you some examples of how you might vary the shock. You can also go the other way and start with the outcome and vary it, do the toggle switch. So if you say, for example, the literature has really been focused on uh, the income effects, this is a current discussion, the income effects of adopting aquaculture, of adopting fish farming, okay? Income effects, income effects, what about nutrition effects? Okay, so that's exactly what the new literature is doing. It says everybody knows what income affects, but does it hurt your nutrition? You know, maybe the people were used to eating calcium-rich, small, bony fish in their ponds, and now they're gone, and it, it affects their nutrition. Um, you know, you could also look at variation not on income, but let's say um, on um, <coughs> intra-household distribution of income, rather than household-level distribution of income. So you can start, you know, for example, if you, if you, you could vary the outcome and then look at what behavior and shock would be necessary to produce that outcome. Uh, or you could write a paper that instead of focusing on the normal outcome everybody has looked at, you can toggle it and look at a different kind of outcome. <clears throat> now, the most complex and the most articles are typically on doing variation in uh, the module of behavior. You know, this is behavior. The supply of labor is a function of these incentives and capacity variables. So um, I went through, this is what I did in the 1990s, so some of the literature says 1970s and 1980s, but it's still relevant. You can think about it. Uh, I, I looked at a bunch of articles and I said, what well, was the trick? And what I found that is absolutely fascinating if you do this, is that the trick to publishing was simple in every case. Simple. All you use is the toggle switch. Let me give you an example. Okay, and it often starts with some observation of reality and then a toggle switch. So, uh, in the Green Revolution, which is rapid change uptake of these new varieties of rice, etc., uh, people were noticing in the 1970s that even though the thing looked good, profitable, valuable, only 40% or 50% of the farmers were adopting. And the agricultural scientists were getting angry and they were saying, this is stupid, why are they not adopting? It's obviously profitable for them, it's good for them, why are they not adopting? And so uh, Rumaset thought about that and then looked at a, a, you know, a demand function, let's say, a demand for, you know, imagine you know, a new seed is a function of the price of the seed, you know, and uh, let's say price of other things, the price of... Um, the agricultural products, some risk, some capital. Um, and so what he was essentially, he was saying, if you specify this as a linear function, uh, then there might be some issue of explaining this because it's possible that it's not linear, that it's nonlinear. So you just toggle switch that and say, Let's take a look. This obviously we're not using the normal function to explain. Let's just flip it and say, what, what if I had a nonlinear function where you have a kink, where it means that something is low until it gets to a threshold tipping point and then flips? 
You can think of that all the time in your lives, right? And so he said, let's do a function that has some tipping point, impose that on the data, run the data regressions, and what he found uh, is that, uh, in fact, uh, instead of it being a linear function, it was a safety first model that the farmers were doing. Think about it. You say, yes, you know, I'd like to invest in the seeds, but that's an investment that made, it's risky, and unless the profitability is above a certain point, then it won't compensate me for disaster that might occur from these seeds. So I want to make sure it's the profitability is above this point before I even go away from safety first into risky behavior. So you're waiting for the payoff to be big enough. You can feel that in all your lives. If you're the reviewer, you're saying, I feel what he's saying. I know that that's the way people think. And he, he, all he did is flip the functional form and then started a whole new literature, focusing on the risk, focusing on the tipping points, focusing on the threshold investment. <clears throat> Here's another example. Nurlov uh, looked at the supply response literature and found, you know, and, and, and realized that in the literature, <coughs> agriculture <coughs> was taken as an aggregate sector. And um, this was at a time in the 1970s, 1980s with structural adjustment and the prices were going up, incentives were increasing, but he found that farmers were not reacting very much as a sector. Okay, and um, in that sense, long-term elasticities with respect to prices of aggregate output of agriculture was were very inelastic, not very much change. <clears throat> so he just did the toggle switch and said, that's aggregate, what about disaggregate? Okay, now let's look at it by crop. And he found that, um, thank you sir. <clears throat> and he found that um, over, when you start to disaggregate by crops, um, you know, in fact, the findings from this literature, <clears throat> the aggregate model, had been a feeling that farmers are not responsive. They're not rational economically. They don't care what the prices are. They said, how can that be? Every farmer I really talk to in the field is talking about prices from the morning to the night. Did your dad ever talk about prices? Pretty long. Only 12 hours a day. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so then he disaggregated. He said, let's do corn versus wheat versus hay versus this versus that. And suddenly he found that that farmers were extremely re responsive to prices. They were very rational, and it changed the whole debate because you know, because he found it was a question of disaggregation. <clears throat> Another would be, for example, the level of actor um, in the drip irrigation. You know, drip irrigation was a big uh, issue in the 80s, as it was adopted in Israel and other places, and uh, <clears throat> the farm. You know, all of the regressions and the work in the articles that were done on it were at the farm level, but they were poorly explaining the adoption. You know, they had very low R squares. They were poorly uh, explaining the adoption of drip irrigation. <clears throat> so then some of the enterprising people said, let's take a look at this at the le level of the cooperative, not at the level of the farm. Why? Why did they say that? Get ready, get set. Go. And think about explaining the adoption of it and its diffusion across areas. <clears throat> Why would the co-op matter? Yes, ma'am. Costs? Of setting it up. Cost of setting it up. You're warm, but not, you didn't go for the gold. Yes. Could be social learning, but you're, you're warmer. What are the costs of setting it up? <clears throat> are they all individual? See, now I would never do that if I was a reviewer. I wouldn't give you, I wouldn't bring the horse to the water and then take the water in my hands and give it to the horse, right? But I'm doing it for you there. So, are they all individual costs? No. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. They're often collective costs and collective investments. The whole co-op might set up the well and might do all the stuff and then the whole co-op uh, uh, adopts. <clears throat> so they found that by an analyzing it at a cooperative level, you know, they could explain a lot, okay? And also, in the 1990s, there was a lot of uh, focus, you know, on, well, we've seen there's been a lot of adoption of these new technologies like Green Revolution, new seeds, fertilizer, etc. But is it percolating to women in the households? Or are they being left out? So, it went from a household level to, to disaggregating, let's say, by the individual level, the gender level, 
And that was another whole range of articles and ideas. And it was all, you can see, just toggle switch. They say farm, let's go up, let's go down at level, and then they explore, and then it often is related to some general debate that's going on. <clears throat> another one that's fascinating was by my major professor. Uh, very simple, when you think about this incredible simpleness of these articles, it was all a toggle switch. They said, look at... Oh, this is the time of structural adjustment. Incentives are going up for farmers. They should be willing to go into the market. But then in many places they found that even though incentives went up, the farmers didn't sell to the market. You know, and, they, and, and people would say, why? Most people said what they said in the 1960s. Farmers are culturally, they don't like to market. Farmers are different spiritual people that don't care about money. Now, if you work in the field and don't just work at a desk, have you ever met a farmer that didn't care about money? I never met one in 35 years in the field. Everybody that just spends time in conferences always says, yes, the farmers are really, they just love their nature and whatever, but everybody wants money, okay? And so he said, look, if you look at the, um, let's say the producer price, um, and you, you know, it should be equal to what for an economist? At, at, at equilibrium. Marginal cost. marginal cost, exactly. Okay, but um, if, it's, if it's lower than marginal cost, then they won't sell. And he said, this is kind of like, duh, because there was already, in fact, he took it from a discussion that was happening in the institutional economics literature that was like Al Schmidt, whatever. That was every, completely hidden from the entire debate. You know, they were in their own world. Okay, but they were talking about something very interesting, transaction costs. You say, transaction costs. You know, it's normal to you to hear that word. But back then, it was like, I heard about this thing, transaction costs, and, and you say, transport costs, and uh, how, what would you do to this equation to make it so that the farmer wouldn't want to sell if you added transaction costs to this equation? How would you add it? This is how simple it was. Hopefully you'll answer right away so it shows how simple it is. If you don't answer fast, then it seems like it's genius. Yes, ma'am. You're giving me a lot of answers, so please. One minus the transaction cost. Um, if the transaction cost is not zero, but it actually is quite expensive in bad roads and everything for the farmer to get to the market, then you subtract the transaction costs. And so the, the actual producer price uh, faced by the farmer is much less than the marginal cost and he doesn't sell. And it seems this is so obvious. Uh, and that was the whole article. It was a highly cited article, but it was just saying, uh, transact no transaction costs? Let's toggle that. Transaction costs. If you put transaction costs here immediately, it explains everything. If you have CP is equal to MU, what's MU? Marginal utility. So the consumer price is equal to marginal utility. Now, if, it's, if the consumer price is greater than marginal utility, does the consumer go from their village and go over and buy? No. So what would you do for here? This is going to be easy. To make them buy? I'm sorry? Are you saying what would you need to do well, to make them To make them not buy. not buy. What would you add to this? Same article. Answer's easy. Get ready. Get set. Go. Okay. You just add the two transaction costs because you say, "Here I am, hungered in my, you know, my my village, and I know I could go over and buy something in this other town. Am I going to go? If I don't have any transaction costs to go get it, and the CP is the consumer price is just equal to the margin utility, I'm cool. I'm going to go. But if suddenly you say the transaction cost is high, it takes me all day to go to that other to, to the town." then the consumer price plus this transaction costs are greater than the marginal utility. Look at how easy that was. He just looked at the toggle switch on the nature of costs. Are there transaction costs or are there not? And then he added them to this and he immediately, in this simple e economics 101 way, explained why people don't enter the market and change the debate and everybody starts talking about the transaction costs. Thousands of citations, but if you look at it, it was very mechanical to do this, wasn't it? Okay, so if you then, <clears throat> you know, um, I'm getting to the end. <clears throat> you know, the, um, you know, what I did in my work 
is I just, you know, as I already explained, is I just said, let's flip it from farm to non-farm, so I changed the sector. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I already explained all this, what the farming system literature is doing, migration literature, non-farm labor supply. So I already went through this and, uh, and created my article, so I've already told you this story. <clears throat> then what I did, and this is one of my points, is I said, okay, I'm going to build a research program if you're doing a dissertation, you could do this as a series of articles with different toggle switches, different shocks. If you're doing this as a program of a, as a young professor over five years, you could say, well, first I looked at, you know, the determinants of non-farm, okay, of non-farm participation. Then I looked at non-farm participation on income, overall income, for example. Then I can again say, well, Everybody's doing this, but I'm going to do a toggle switch and I'm going to look at non-farm income on the adoption of farm technology. Okay, why would that matter? Why would whether you have non-farm employment or not affect uh, the um, having agricultural, uptaking agricultural technology? Let me give you an example. This is a great example from uh, Chris Barrett in Madagascar. Sustainable rice intensification, have you heard of that? Yeah. Have you heard of agroforestry? Yes. Okay, so sustainable rice intensification was the big, everybody loved it in the 1990s and 2000s, and they were saying, if here's a way you can save using fertilizer and chemicals and this and that, uh, but it requires more labor. You have to set up agroforestry and bring the manure over and do this and do that. Um, and so, you know, if you look at this and you say, if you're in a world, let's say that you, you look at this and you say, I'm in a world where I only farm. So if something is a little bit better than nothing, I'll do it if I only farm. But in a world where there's non-farm employment and there's multi-sectoral opportunity, opportunity cost of time, meaning I'm judging when I'm looking at what I'm going to do on farm on what it'll cost me in terms of doing something off farm, your point. You say, wow. You know, if, I'm on, if I have this farm to deal with, I'm not going to go off farm and do this. But if I'm doing something off farm that's valuable, more valuable than the farm, then if I say, well, somebody here wants me to plant rows of bushes and do this and do this and do this, is that worth my time relative to spending it off farm? Okay, and what he found <clears throat> is this is an adoption curve. Here's adoption. Over time, in Madagascar of the SRI and what it did it looked like this it went whoop. everybody adopted very exciting everybody just adopted okay it's the same thing happened actually with deep placement urea uh, for fertilizer in ba Bangladesh everybody adopted whoop, and then whoop, everybody just adopted and when the regressions were done for both the SRI and the deep placement urea thing in Bangladesh, they found that it was rural non-farm employment on the right-hand side, you know, that, that, if, that affected the demand. Because people said, wow, this is in competition with doing all this work to put the urea in or set up the agroforestry. So the environmentalists and everybody were very angry with these results because they, or the technolo agricultural technology people often react against this kind of regression because they say, but it's good for them to do this. They're stupid, why are they not doing that? But then you, you say, well, they're not doing it because they have, from their point of view, better earnings off the farm, okay? This really came to me when I was in Burkina Faso in 1984, or 1985, and there was a, a big drought in the uh, <coughs> non-farm <clears throat> and the, the environmentalists and the agricultural technologists had got all the farmers to do these buns and terraces to set up. <clears throat> I came in right after the big storm, <clears throat> and, the, uh, uh, and there was beautiful topsoil behind all the buns and terraces on the, on the plots. And uh, I asked the farmers then, how do you like these, these buns that have been, you've been paid for by ICRASAT, this institution? to build these buns on your farm. Everybody said, these are beautiful, fantastic. I said, if Icarus had left, and it was just to you to build them and maintain them, would you do that? The whole group of farmers laughed. 
They said, why would we do this? This is crazy. I said, what, what are you talking about? Why do you say it's crazy? Because usually we do rural non-farm employment during the dry season. That's the way we even survive. We don't survive from this millet. We die. And if it doesn't rain and we have the beautiful buns, then we die again. Okay, and, they, and so then that was in my life when I realized this whole thing about the competition was there and then becomes a kind of a way of understanding technology disadoption. It becomes a second step in uh, this kind of analysis and this kind of work. Now to end the talk, I want to say how I do so many articles quickly <clears throat> in, a, in a kind of a trick for you. The trick is... Um, what I call speed writing. Uh, so what I do first, as I mentioned earlier, is I, I'm saying, I want, I'm, let's say I'm working on something on herder uh, interactions with farmers. I'm going to go to the literature and I'm going to take the literature and I'm going to map it out as a shock behavior outcome. What kind of shocks, you know, for example, sedentarization programs of government or uh, whatever, you know, urbanization or changes in land value or whatever you know is a shock. And I'm going to look at what did the literature do. I'm going to look at what outcomes they, they examined. Then I'm going to map what are the behavioral modules and the way that they did it uh, over time. Investment in boreholes, you know, wh what did they map in the literature. And then I'm going to see then where the toggle switches are that made careers of the different people that wrote. And then I love to do that because I said, this is amazing. They just took, you know, something where there was no sedentarization policy and then they they put one in place, and that was all they did, and, and then that was the beginning of a new literature strand until it came to a gap. What happens if this versus that, and then they shocked it again. So I map it. Then what I do is, once I have my analysis and, and work, is I always do dense and denser outlines. Okay, I don't start by writing, because you get lost in the writing, then you don't want to throw it out. And the way that I do these dense outlines um, in Berkeley, I don't know if they have it anymore or if they have it in Nigeria or in Scotland, you know, blue book exams where you have a blue book, you open, you put your name on the front and then the professor says you have two hours to open the book, here's the questions, begin writing. Okay, and what I remember at Berkeley, I was always amazed that after, uh, you know, two, after two hours I had written the equivalent of an article or at least a large section of an article. Be why? Why did I... Was I able to do so much? I was scared. Okay, that's obvious. But why else do you think I was able to write so much in that two hours? I use this to create the dense outline. And, and uh, one thing that does that is I'll ask myself. So if you go back up, you know, for example, I go, this is exactly how I do it. I come up to this. And I say, okay, <clears throat> Tom, there's a blank piece of paper. I have two hours. I have my coffee sitting there. And I say, the, the exam question is the following. What are the gaps of literature, when, uh, what is the gap of literature most important to answer, justified in terms of four steps in the prior literature that left a gap, and uh, uh, you have two hours, get ready, get set, go. And then I'll sit there and I'll say, I'm going to do my dense outline answering the question that I myself posed to myself, but I will answer it and I'll say, oh, okay, wait, wait, okay, there was the Z-Good literature, and then there was the agriculture wage literature, then there's the migration literature, then there's the non-farm. I'll do those four steps in my answer, and then time's up, and I'll have that part of the introduction then. Then I'll say, now go have a coffee, go relax, walk around the yard, come back, and say, now, given the gap that you proposed in the answer to the first exam, your second exam, which for which you have two hours, is to um, state two or three research questions that come directly out of that gap and justify their importance in the literature and in the debate. Get ready, get sad, go. And then you know you do that. And I do that myself. I sit there and I do it. And then I say, okay, now that you, uh, you know what's coming, third two hours, you know, I get ready and I say, okay, now you have to have... Um, hypotheses for each of the research questions that you had, and in every case you have to have two conflicting answers to the hypothesis. Yes and no, yes and no. And you must do that. Okay, you don't have an option. And so in that case then, 
uh, you, you generate those as part of your exam answer. You don't allow yourself to just say, well, this is what I think, you know. No, you have to answer the opposite. And then you know that you're going to, and et cetera. So then the rest of the paper, I even do the same thing. You know, I go through and I, you know, I go through this. Um, you know, I go and then say, I have two hours or three hours to do the general theory and state it and justify it. Uh, and then I have another two hour exam on the context. You're only allowed, and then I, I impose this on myself that to make it excellent. I say, Tom, you're only allowed four points of context. No more than four points, and they must be numbered. Then you go, wow, there's so many points I could do. Really? Well, that's your problem because you only have four points. And that forces you then to get the four key points. You know, if you say, I'm, you know, I'm justifying aquaculture discussion in Kebi, but I've decided to talk about the cropping pattern. Is that one of the points you want to waste on that? Is that important or not important? You have to then, and then also the same thing with descriptive statistics. There, you might have already done your analysis so that you have something to hand, you know, that you can use and describe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the way I do the articles. I give myself two days to write an article or three. And that, that I always remember because when I, if I had known this, if I'd heard this talk back in my earlier days, when I came out of my dissertation, Journal of Development Economics, a good journal, wanted my thesis is an article. And I remember going, and, and a postdoctoral fellow said, let's do it. In one week, we can have this article. I said, no, no, no. I need six months to write the article. I always remember this right now. I need six months. And, and now, today, I realize that, that that was just insane. I didn't understand the method of it. And all I needed was two or three days in understanding the structure, and then could have shoved it in and had it out. So with that, I want to uh, thank you for sitting through this talk, and I hope you have very much success in your, in your article writing.